All right, all right, good morning, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here this morning. Man, we know this song. Come on, let's begin to clap like this. Come on. Come on. We're going to give God our all this morning, knowing that scriptures tell us to clap our hands in the sanctuary and to shout for joy with a voice of triumph. So let's sing this together, loud voices. We will, we will not be shaken. Come on. We will not be moved. For the Lord. Say. For the Lord is inside us. Yeah, yeah. With him we cannot lose. Hey, hey. For the shadows surround us. Hey. We will feel no evil. Why? We'll trust in the Lord. Yeah. Oh, the night may seem weary. Joy is coming, coming, coming in the morning. All oh, praise to King Jesus. I know joy is coming. Joy is, joy is coming. Oh Lord, you're so good, you're so good. Let's sing it again. Church, say, we will not be shaken. Psalms 1. We will not be moved. We meditate on the word day and night. The Lord is beside us. With him we cannot. With him we cannot lose. Though the shadows may rise. Though the shadows surround us. We will fear no evil. We will fear no evil. We'll trust in the Lord with our heart. In your joy, we will dwell forever. Though the night, though the night may seem weary, joy is coming, coming, coming in the morning. All praise to King Jesus. I know joy is coming. Though the night may seem weary, though the night may seem weary. Joy is coming. Joy is coming. Yes, mighty God. Come on, break it down. See, when we sing words, they're not just words and beautiful melodies. They're not just just playing strings. These are prayers. That's exactly what we're doing this morning. So let's pray this together. No matter where you're feeling. No matter what you're feeling, that God is magnificent and He is strong and His light outshines our darkness, all right? Your light can drown our darkness and bring your joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow, our joy is coming in the morning. In the morning. Your light can drown our darkness and bring your joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. In the morning, oh Lord, wake us up. In the morning. Say your light, come on, Holy Lake. Say your light. Your light can drown our darkness and bring your joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. I want us to understand that God holds it all. He holds our joy and our pain. And I even know some friends right now that are experiencing so much pain even right now with loss. And he holds it all. 
So if you're singing these words and, and it's hard to say that joy is coming in the morning, that's because the night can be really long. And that's okay. Let's sing this together till we believe it, all right? Your light can shine our darkness and bring your joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. You hold it all. In the morning. You believe it? Come on, clap with me a little bit. Say Your light can shine our darkness and bring your joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning.
closer than just saying God. So if, you, if you've never even thought about that before, maybe let's just sing this one more time, one more time, and then we'll, 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 we'll skip to the next song. But if you've never even thought about that before, Jehovah, you are the most high God. Singing praise and honor to the great I am. Can we do that one more time? See, I, I, I love the thing about music and creativity because we can be as creative as we like and God is still listening and still honoring you. So even at this moment, let's just whisper it. Let's just whisper it if we can. Getting close to your, your father, getting close to your Abba. Let's say, Jehovah. give God some praise. Amen. He's the most high God holding it all. Amen. God, you are good. Man, I feel like singing that song two more times. God, you're so good. God, you are good. You are good. You are good. You are so good. Holder of all things, creator of the universe, giver of breath. not too small. Your sight isn't too short. Amen? You're more real wind in my
ground that I'm standing on. know that your thoughts say your thoughts not my thoughts time in worship I just want us to pray one thing out we'll just sing it twice and we'll end our time and it's really easy it's come tear down the walls I build up let's just sing that out come tear down the walls I built every wall I built every wall I built cause you, cause you deserve every piece of my every piece of my every piece of my last time come tear down the walls I built every wall I built every wall I built cause you deserve every piece of my every piece of my Every piece of my heart. Let me just give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord, for being with us this morning. Amen. 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 Good morning, Overlake. Good morning. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful to come together and worship, to worship with one another every morning. My name is uh, Royce. I'm the worship pastor here. Good morning. 
Good morning. I'm Bethany, and I'm one of the leaders on the worship team. It's, it's so cool to worship in this big space and hearing everybody's voice lifted for those sweet moments and just entering into one voice as we sing. Yes, 100%. And it, 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 it is so beautiful, and I, I love that we get to come together and do that every morning. I just want to do something real quick before we go to the QR code. Can we just, just give God praise one more time? Can we just clap? Like, just hearing, hearing that is something beautiful. Amen. So what we like to do um, at Overlake is to um, get connected. And we do that by scanning a QR code. And this is the QR code right here. And so go ahead and take a second as we're talking to you guys and pull out your phones and scan that QR code. Whether you've been here a um, hundred times or this is your first time, this is a great way to get connected. Yeah, and for everybody online joining at home, there's um, a tab that you can click, and that will bring you to our connection card, too, with ways that you can step into generosity or get connected here at Overlake. 100%. 100%. So as you do that, um, we thought of a question, yes. and I think I'm kind of wording it wrong, so I got to get it right. So um, as you do that, this is the question that we want you to greet everyone with. Yes. Okay, so it was daylight savings time. So are you the person that stayed up that extra hour or did you go to bed early getting the extra sleep? Yeah, find out. let's find out that. Did you stay up an extra hour or did you go to bed early to get one extra hour of sleep? So let's greet one another before Pastor Neely comes and talks to us. It's so good to be together today. With everybody's looking a little bit more refreshed, like we got an extra hour of sleep. Some of you were on time for the first time since last fall on this day. You know, good job. Good job. Well, my name is Neely. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here, and we are in week six of our uh, study, our time in Ephesians. We've been working our way through Paul's letter it, this letter that he wrote to a church community in Ephesus, he didn't write it to a singular church, but multiple churches, multiple believers who gathered. And one way to look at kind of this letter that Paul wrote is to see how it's formatted. If you were to pay attention, you would notice that the first part of the letter really is about how we think, how we understand. Paul wants the believers in Ephesus to have a good understanding, a strong understanding of Christ's life, Christ's death, and Christ's resurrection. He wants them to understand how this good news impacts the believers, both Jews and Gentiles. We've said from the beginning, one of the biggest themes of the book of Ephesians is unity. And so Paul wants the believers to understand, to know, to, to have certainty of belief in an uncertain world that Christ's death, Christ's resurrection unites us to Christ and, and unites us to one another. And so he wants us to think on it. He wants us to meditate on it. He wants us to understand it. But it's not just a good letter about theology. It's not just a good letter about how to think. Uh, Paul then is going to move this second half of the letter to how we live. He's in sense essentially saying like, look, I've told you, I've explained to you how we should believe. And now I'm going to talk about how this should in fact inform the way you live in the world, how you show up. Because Paul's a pastor, and he, so he doesn't, he's not a teacher. He's not looking for grading your understanding. He, Paul was, he wanted to know if people were living it out. That what they heard and understood showed up in how they lived in the world. And so as we move into this action, this how you live, what's important to know is the theme of unity does not go away. The theme of unity stays strong, right? So Paul's saying now he's going to talk about how we live, and he's going to talk about how we live to protect our unity, and how we live that could disrupt our unity. Not only our unity with Christ, but our, our unity with one another. Now Paul's not saying 
our behavior will separate us from Christ. That would be very unPaul-like, right? Even in the start of this letter, Paul says, it is by faith we are saved, not works. So he's not saying your living, your particular living will separate you from Christ, but he is saying it will disrupt your unity with Christ. It will disrupt how you experience unity. It will, expect, it will, inter, it will impact how we experience unity as one, with one another. So today we're going to dive into a pretty large chunk of Ephesians. Last week we started chapter 4, we're going to finish chapter 4, and we're going to read part of chapter 5 as well. We're going to do a big chunk. And I'm really excited. We're going to do this today. We're going to talk about how we live. And then next Sunday, Josh, my husband, and I are going to co-teach. And we're going to co-teach on the last part of chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6. And it's on household roles. And there is a part in there about marriage. So we're going to tell you a little bit about um, how we practice Ephesians, what Paul's writing in Ephesians in our marriage. Um, And it should be filled with um, shocking stories. No, it won't be. Um, it'll mostly be like, and here's how we messed up, but we're still figuring it out. We inj- invite you to join us with us. It's going to be great. Um, Josh loves being on the microphone. That's why you see him up here all the time. Um, so it'll be great for us to be up here together. I'm excited for you to hear from him directly um, and us to do that together. It'll be fun. Before we dive in, let's pray. Let's pray before we start this passage. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness for your love, for the impact of your life and your death and your resurrection, that we get to be in relationship with you. We start from a place of gratitude. We start from a place of wanting to understand that, God, to believe that, and then to see how that informs our lives. So God, would you open our hearts? Would you soften our hearts? Would you soften our hearts to hear what we need to hear today? That where conviction needs to be, where uh, repentance needs to be, confession. God, I pray that that would be true. That our hearts would be ready for those, those moments and those steps. In Jesus' name, amen. So the goal for this passage are like, because Paul's taking this turn of moving from here's how you should think to here's how you're, you should live, I actually want to do something a little different with how we, we orient our message. Because if it's about how we live, it wouldn't make total sense for me just to spend 25 minutes talking at you. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through a couple different chunks of passages. And after each chunk, we'll, I'll give you a question. And then I'll give you 30 seconds, uh, so not a lot of time, but some time, to sit with that question and just reflect. Here's what I guarantee, is it's going to feel, feel weird. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel like, why are we doing this? And actually, that's the point, um, to give us a little space to be uncomfortable, to wrestle, to reflect with these questions. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to pick up in chapter 4 where we left off last week. We're going to start in verse 17. This is what Paul writes. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So last week we looked at this passage, Uh, we started in chapter 4, and Paul starts out, he says this, he says in how he started the very first section, he said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord for my calling. I'm a prisoner. And he's like, I want you to know how much this costs me to do this work. Now Paul says, hey, I want you to remember I have authority. I'm authorized Uh, You need to trust what I'm about ready to say because I have been authorized by the Holy Spirit to give this word. So you're going to need to trust my credibility. You're going to need to trust my authority. And it's from this place of authority that Paul says, now here is how you should live. And if I was going to sum up this section, this is what he's saying. 
no longer go along with the crowd. Stop following the crowd. He uses Gentiles here. The way he uses this word, Gentiles, this label, is in a sense those who are not united with Christ. He's not talking about those who are Gentile and are part of the community. He's talking about those who have yet to be united with Christ and united with each other. So he's saying, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like those who are yet united to Christ. In fact, be opposite. Be as those who are associated with Christ, aligned with Christ's way. And then he makes this contrast between the two, right? He goes kind of back and forth between the two, showing what their lives would look like. For the Gentile, the Gentile is confused. They're confused. But he says those who are united in Christ have learned a new truth, have learned the truth. He says that the contrast is one, know, one is confused, one knows truth. And so, again, that would explain why Paul spends the first part of this letter focusing on what should we believe? What should we understand? How, what truth should we know? But now he's saying there's a contrast. Those who are confused and those who understand the truth. He says those who are not united yet with Christ are full of darkness. But those who are believers have left all of those ways behind. Those who are not united with Christ have a closed mind and a hardened heart, a calloused heart. But those who are united with Christ and with others, they have renewed thoughts, renewed attitudes. And renewal, in comparison to calloused and hardened, right? Renewal speaks to the ability to be changed, to be transformed. That which is calloused and hard can't be changed, can't be renewed. He's making this comparison. Paul says they have no shame. Now, this Greek word for shame, it actually is the word unfeeling. It means this, that those who were not yet united with Christ had no sense of internal feeling that what they were doing was right or wrong. The, the, the spirit working in them, that, that conviction that, man, this action I'm taking is not right, was gone. They, had, they were unfeeling versus those who were united with Christ, right? They had a new guide, the spirit living in them. They were aware, a new attitude, new feelings. The spirit was guiding how they lived. And so he's saying, look, if you look at us who are united with Christ and with each other, and you look at those who aren't, there should be a difference. We should look different. Because this internal change, this internal transformation, this thing in which we say we believe is showing up in how we live. You can see it in how we live, how we live with Christ, how we live with one another. He's saying, look, our belonging changes us. It transforms us. So here's where I want to start. This is our first reflection For those in particular, if you have said, yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus' life, in Jesus' death and resurrection. The question, the reflection is, does this yes in my life, this belief in my life, show up in the way I live? What has happened in my heart and in my mind, does it show up in the actions of my life? So here's our question. How has being united to Christ and others, and united to others, transformed the way you live? So let's just take 30 seconds to reflect on that. All right, some of you, you're like, I need more than 30 seconds. I would encourage you to take more than 30 seconds this week. Sit with this question, process, reflect, allow the Spirit to lead you. And some of you are like, oh my word, never do that to me again. You know, 
I honestly was one of those people. That, that felt a little uncomfortable for me. I was watching that clock. I was counting it down. And I just want to encourage us, that's me included, that there is power in that space of reflection. That in fact, this invitation that we hear throughout Scripture to be in the world but not of the world, to be different, to, to stand apart, requires us to get quiet. It requires us to make space in our life where we can reflect and ask the Spirit, are there ways in my life that need to be transformed? Are there parts of my life that need to be changed? So I encourage you, if 30 seconds was hard, let's do 30 seconds a couple times this week. Let's lean into this a little bit. So let's pick up in verse 25. And this is where Paul really starts to get real practical, really into it. So verse 25. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. All right, so Paul moves from these broad strokes of like, we should be different to these really specific examples, right? And he's saying, here's some vices you should avoid, and here's some virtues you should pursue. It, it, Paul's saying this, and this is an important, there's this, there's this distinction that I think we need to lean into. That Paul is saying the Holy Spirit is in us. He says he's redeemed us. The Holy Spirit has redeemed us, sealed us, guaranteed our salvation. That's true. And that, that by itself will begin to transform us. But Paul's also saying there's this responsibility on the believer to pursue certain behaviors, to pursue certain virtues, that, to strengthen those virtues in our life. So there's a work of the Holy Spirit, and then there's the work that we jump into, that we lean into, that we join in. And he's, and he's saying, and I think it's important, this again, the unity is the theme. So these vices and these virtues impact our unity, our unity with Christ and our unity with one another. And here's how. The first of all, you and I were united. Um, Actually, not a choice. It just happens. When we believe in Christ, we are united. So our holiness, our wholeness as a community is tied up in each other. Meaning, your actions or things that happen to you impact me just as equally as my actions or things that happen to me impact you. If our arms were linked, we were holding hands, and something was happening to me, it would happen to you. And that's what Paul's saying here, is we are united, we are one in Christ. And so our vices and our virtues impact how that experience is lived out. And in the same way, there are things we can do to each other that will disrupt our unity. Uh, I think Paul's pretty clear, right? Lying, stealing, slander, when we allow our anger to control us. Guess what disrupts unity? Those things. Because you know why? True story. You cannot be unified with someone who's lying to you. You can't. You also can't be unified to someone who's stealing from you. You can't be unified with someone who's slandering you. You can't be unified with someone whose actions, has le- their anger, their emotions have led them to sin against you. It's, it disrupts the unity. But Paul doesn't say just don't do those things. And he says instead do these things. Choose this behavior, which I love that. Paul says where, where you were going to tell a lie, tell the truth. Check. Uh, he, he talks about anger, and I think it's interesting. I want to point out a little bit of nuance in this passage. Anger. If you look at the original Greek, Greek Paul asks, actually says, be angry. 
be angry. Just don't let your anger lead to sin. I don't know about you, but in my experience growing up, anger was not an emotion I had permission to have. I wasn't allowed in my home to feel anger. And then I heard messages at church that said I couldn't be angry, in particular as a woman, that anger was not okay. Paul says, be angry. Because there are things in this world that are worth being angry about. There are. When you go on a nice vacation to Spain and a bird poops on your head, you should be angry. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I know. That's, this is a setup for our marriage talk next week, you know. <laughs> what it means to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Clean the poop out of her hair. But when I hear about churches who abuse their power and use their power to justify harm and pain towards others, you know what? I'm angry. When I hear about people who are leaders using their platforms to dehumanize refugees, I'm angry. When I hear leaders with power using their voice to say someone is garbage, I'm angry. We should be angry. But Paul says, don't let that anger lead you somewhere that it shouldn't. So we have a responsibility. Work out that anger. Navigate it. Don't go to bed with it. Work it out. But when your anger becomes hate, when your anger becomes violence, when your anger becomes harm, when your anger becomes avoidance, we're letting anger control. And in that way, we're disrupting our unity. We're disrupting our unity. He says, don't steal. Instead, you know, find work. But Paul doesn't stop at find work. Paul says, what else? He says, be generous then. Right? It's this vice. There's the vice of stealing. There's the virtue of generosity. That in Christ, our unity, our oneness is connected to the vices we have in our life and the virtues we have in our life. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Paul says, speak up. Use words not to tear down but to build up. He, he says this. He says, I love this. Uh, Paul says, kindness. Be tenderhearted. He's acknowledging that there is this reality that our connection to each other is deeply tied to our ability to be kind, to be loving, to be tenderhearted, to be forgiving. And in those ways, when we do those things, he's saying we're like Christ. We're like God in those things. And he goes on. Let's keep reading. You'll see this. In, verse, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says this. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such, such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, there, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an adulterer, worshiping the things of this world. Paul says, be like God. He says, imitate God. And what's so interesting to me is the imitation that Paul is calling us to is kindness, is love, is forgiveness. See, we gotta be, we gotta like think straight on this because there's a little bit of a, a misunderstanding here. We, we read it and we say, be like God. And then we start to think about how we view God and ideas we have about God, and we start to implement those. Like, for example, we think, oh, God's all powerful. God's in control of everything. God, God, God judges everything. God's dominating everything. No, that's not what Paul's saying. He says, be like God. Be kind. Be generous. Be tenderhearted. He goes as far as to say, lay down your life in the same way that God has. 
That's the invitation. And then Paul says, here, you know, there's a couple habits that we have. Immorality, impurity, and greed. And I know those are three words that everybody loves to talk about. They are everybody's favorite words to really dive into. Paul's not afraid. And Paul says, look, it's not just our actions too. It's our words when it's connected to those. How we live it out. Again, in my church experience, I'll speak to my church experience I've heard a lot of focus on part of these habits. I've heard a lot of focus on immorality and impurity with very little attention to greed. I have experienced, in my, again, in my context, that we'll talk about giving, but we rarely get close to greed. It, it, in fact, it's, it's interesting. One of the most common questions that I get asked when someone's trying to determine what kind of pastor, preacher, church we are, is this. What do you teach about sex and sexuality? Number one question, every time. What's so strange to me is I lead a church, co-lead a church, in one of the wealthiest places in the world. And no one asks me, what do you teach about greed? What do you teach about money? Isn't that interesting? I think it reveals something about us. I, um, I think it reveals a couple things about us. Maybe, maybe it reveals if we can say, hey, look at that thing over here and don't pay attention to my thing. Let's talk about that thing over there. Uh, it's, it's easier. Distract. What Paul is going after here is behavior, vices, that will bring disunity to the unity of our relationship with God and one another. And it could be connected to your view of the sacredness of sex, and it could be connected to your love of money. Paul's saying both of these things need equal attention. Both of these things need to be evaluated in our own lives. Because he's saying, what do these actions say about who we worship? What are they saying about who we worship? And in the context, the, the church in Ephesus, there was a lot of similarities to the church in Redmond, Washington. In the sense that there's a culture that has a lot to say about sex and there's a culture that has a lot to say about our money. And both of them have real potential to be idols in our lives. And Paul's saying, when you worship them, it disrupts your unity with each other and with God. That's what's happening. And if we're going to invite ourselves into relationship with God, and we're going to invite ourselves into relationship with each other, we have to be willing to lay down our idols like God laid down his life. Those things go together. So we've talked about vices and virtues and habits. And now I want to invite you to reflect for 30 seconds on this question. Are there habits in your life that are disrupting your unity with Christ and with others? Go ahead and reflect. Right. When we identify those habits, those vices, there is an invitation to repent, to confess, to uh, seek out support and guidance, to, to kind of invite others in to your journey, to work out how do we live in this world? What virtues should we strengthen in each other and in ourselves? So that is the invitation. We'll continue starting in verse 6. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. 
For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now Paul begins to kind of wrap up this section using similar language that we started with, right? This darkness and this light and this contrast. And he's speaking to a day of accountability. He's speaking to a day and he's using the metaphor of a light. And he's saying there will be a day when God's light will reveal it all. We will all be held accountable. The light will show everything. But he's saying there's this present reality right now where light is shining now, even exposing things now in our lives. And he's, he's asking us, Paul is asking us like, to, to trust that God, who is faithful, good, loving, righteous, that when that light comes, it will be good, it will be right, and it will be true. And to trust that even in God's mercy, the light is revealing in us now. That we can trust that the, the, even the revealing of the light is for our benefit. It is for good. It is for what is right. Um, when you think about being in a dark room and you know something's in the corner and you are scared and you can't turn on the light, there's, there's different ways to expose what's in the corner. Uh, one may, way may be a broom to like kind of swing at it, a bat to swing at it, um, smack at it, you know, just... I like to talk and smack at it at the same time just to let it know in case it's living that I'm in charge, who's the boss. But think about how light reveals something. It's so gentle. It's so simple. It's, it's not dangerous. It's not manipulating. It's not harmful. It simply shows up. Light simply shows up. And I think that's how God reveals things in our lives. I don't think God's smacking us around kicking us, yelling at us. I think God simply reveals the light. And we, we see it. And this is, again, where we get a chance to, like, be uncalloused hearts, be unhardened hearts, and respond to that light. And I think light is scary. That idea then becomes scary. What is God going to reveal? What is God going to expose in me? Is it going to be hard? Is it going to be embarrassing? Is it going to be scary? Is it going to be painful? But again, Paul says it's right. It's good. It's true. And it's actually in the light when it's revealed that we find freedom, that we find unity. So this is our last question for the day to sit with. Is what needs to come into the, into the light in your life or into light in our community? Take 30 seconds. Well, we've made it through a lot. We have a little bit more of our passage, and then we'll wrap up. This is what Paul says in verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, don't be fools. Be wise. And, and when I was reading that this week, it brought to mind Jesus, some of Jesus' words. And I want to read it from Matthew 7. This is what Jesus said um, in Matthew 7, verse 24. And the font gets smaller every time I get up here. I think something's happening. How far away is my Bible from me right now? Is it real far? Okay. Anyone who listens to my teaching, this is Jesus, 
and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rains come in torrents and the flood waters rise and the wind blows against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on a bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus says, the greatest story to tell, to tell her of all time, he says, this, the wind is going to come. The storm is going to come. It's guaranteed. There's no way to avoid hardship or pain or struggle in this life. Impossible. If you thought you could, you're wrong. You can't. But Jesus says this inner transformation, this understanding of it, what Christ has done for us, that when we lean into it and live into it, we can withstand the storm. We can withstand it. Paul says this. He says, what? He says evil days are here, but do what the Lord wants you to do. The storm is here. It is hard. And I love this line he just throws in. I think it's so interesting, right? He's like, uh, it's really hard. Don't be drunk. Uh, and I just want to point out, here's what I think Paul's saying. It's really hard. And there are all kinds of habits you and I could pick that will numb our pain. But Paul says those things we pick that we think make our pain better, that it's just numbing it, they actually have the potential to ruin our lives. So what does Paul say do instead? He says sing, worship. We have choices we can make when the storm comes. Here's a reality. I think we're feeling the tension of a storm. As we look ahead to this week, I think there is a collective sense of a, a storm is coming, tension, there's emotions and there's fears and there's unknowns. What kind of day Tuesday will be? And here's what I want to invite us to. Don't be drunk with wine. Sing. Worship. So what I want to invite you to is Wednesday. We're going to gather. We're going to worship. We're going to lean into this. We don't know what the week holds. We don't know what the month holds. We don't know what the year holds. But we do know this. That God is good. God is love. God's life and death and resurrection has transformed our unity, our connection to Christ, and our unity and connection to one another. And so what do we get to do? We get to lean into it and we get to worship together. So I'd invite you to join us on Wednesday. Because what Paul's making very clear in this passage is one big idea is this, that we just don't think about being united to God and one another. We live as one united with Christ and others. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you so much for the hope we have that if we build our life on you, that even in the midst of the storms, even in the midst of the uncertainties, even in the midst of the storms that we create by our own vices, that when we choose to follow you, to be united with you, to live into that reality. And our reality of connection to each other, God, you help us through. So God, may we lean and build our house on you. God, I continue to pray for our hearts to be tender. That the places in our hearts that maybe you're just inviting us into reflection. You're inviting us into confession. You're inviting us into transformation. God, would our hearts and our minds and our lives be willing? And may our unity be rooted in love. And may we be like you, kind and tenderhearted. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank Pastor Neely. That's such a, that's a good word. That's really good.
Ephesians has been really, really good for us. Really, really good. I'm going to actually invite up the ushers. You can come forward. We'll go ahead and receive this morning's gifts, tithes, and offerings. Oh, you didn't even have to come forward. You were right there. Ready. Ready as always. Wonderful. They'll start passing the buckets, um, and then there'll also be a QR code behind me as well. But this is an opportunity for those of us that call Overlake home. This is our faith community. Uh, one way in which that shows up in our life is through giving. Uh, the giving of what God has given to us, a portion of what God has put in our care financially. And so uh, that's essentially what happens in this moment. And again, you can do it, um, you know, not just analog with buckets, but online as well, or if you're watching online. I'm reminded of a couple values that we have as a church, and they all spell the word belong, but one of them is nurturing. We talk about how we celebrate blessings, and then we actually share burdens together. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I get to be in spaces where Overlakers actually ask me, how am I doing? Uh, this happens in, in a men's group on Wednesdays. It even happened in the hallway this morning. A few of you came up, and, and recently I've been sharing... It's been hard at work, which is also church. <laughs> uh, and, and, and part of that is the stress financially. And, and, and we've kind of mentioned this a couple times over the last few weeks here where uh, we've fallen behind from where our budget is that we affirmed as a congregation earlier in the year. And, um, and what it means is we're, you know, near in the last couple months here of, of 2024. And, and I think what the board is realizing of where we're at is that we're going to need to make some adjustments in 2025, just given where we're at, R roughly about half a million dollars behind where we thought we'd be this time of year. And, um, and, and part of that is cutting costs, looking at programming, even looking at personnel. We've been sharing this even with, with staff recently on, on the team. But, but part of it is even just what Pastor Neely led us through. I, I think moments to reflect on uh, am I being generous? Am, am, am I leaning in? And am I being a part of the generosity that's happened here at the church and through the church? And and just know, just know, huge thank you for all of you that are participating in this. And just know a huge invitation for those of you that maybe this is your next step as we do this journey together. And so what I'd like to do is actually invite everyone to stand in this moment. And, and we're going to practice what Pastor Neely was just talking about. Uh, singing of songs and hymns that, that we're directing our hearts, our gaze, our attention is is fixed onto who God is, what God has done, that that, that rules uh, our lives and our decisions and the things that we believe. And it pours out of our hearts. It pours out through song. So let's, let's respond and worship together. And then I'll close service. You call me more. You 
And then I want to bless you out of here. I got actually a little passage from Ephesians I want to read over you. But first, uh, next week, uh, mark on your calendars. Um, after service, there's an opportunity to learn more about the service learning trips that will happen next year, 2025. Uh, and you actually, you don't have to wait all the way till next week. In the hallway, Pastor Laura has a table set up. and You can kind of get more information on, on the different trips that will be heading out and the different emphasis, missional emphasis that we have as a church. And so learn more about that, but just know uh, following church next Sunday, you can learn more. It'll be in Lobby Room North. And then I was also reflecting, uh, uh, we, we always want to remind everyone, if you have a prayer need, if there is any way we can be praying for you, two things. Uh, please let us know on the connection card. Uh, essentially, we're able to capture those as a pastoral team and the elders and a few others to, to be lifting those up throughout the week. So, so we're, we're genuine in that. We, we would love to know on the connection card. And then secondly, uh, there's really great, really great overlakers that um, on your way out, they're wearing a lanyard. They have a little white button, and it just says if you need prayer to ask them. Uh, take them up on that. And, and maybe that's a brave next step that you've never done. You've thought about or whatnot. But, but just as there's things going on in your life, or, or maybe it's on behalf of someone you know and care about, uh, go ahead and request that prayer. And then 
And here's the bonus one. I'm, I'm going to give everyone a uh, something to put on your own prayer uh, lists and whatnot. That's to just be praying over, over like praying over the leadership here, praying over the elders. There's just always so many big things happening. And so just pray for wisdom and favor and clarity and unity and, and all of that. I mentioned a little bit about the finances, but we've also been praying and working really hard on some stuff related to the 27 acres. And so just be praying. Let's just be praying for our church uh, and knowing that, that, that God's going to lead us and guide us. But, but it's one way that we get to lean in together is be praying for this place. And now, Overlake, receive these words. And maybe as you do, instead of putting your faces down, uh, turn, them, turn them heavenward. Look up, if you would, and hear this truth as written by Paul. God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. And so, Lord, I pray, would your spirit do exactly that in our lives as individuals throughout this week? Lord, have your way deep within us, gently moving us and directing us. And then would it be true of us as a church, as one, as a body here, Lord? We love you and we praise you. Have your way in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'll see you what night this week? What night at 7 o'clock? Wednesday, that's right, Wednesday, chapel, 7 o'clock, worship and prayer, be there. Love you guys.